hello everyone, both those of you who are here uh, in person and those of you who are following us uh, virtually. I hear there are many of us, uh, many of you following virtually. Um, so you, you probably understood that we are in the sort of futuristic part of this conference. We discussed transatlantic relations and uh, artificial intelligence in the previous interview. And now we have another very futuristic topic, uh, the healthcare of tomorrow, uh, unlocking the power of data. And I am delighted to be joined here on stage by uh, Angel Martin. Welcome, Angel. Uh, you are Senior Director for Digital Health and Taxation Advocacy at Johnson & Johnson, one of the most important, of course, uh, global healthcare uh, companies in the world. Uh, you have been uh, central in developing their strategy, you know, for the digital policy strategy, both uh, regionally and globally and you have a long-standing interest in um, harnessing the power of digital technologies for healthcare, so you are the ideal person to discuss. Welcome again. Thank you. Look, I mean, I suggest we have only 15 minutes, so I suggest that we, we go straight into the topic and we start sort of understanding where, where we sit at the moment in this field. Um, I think maybe, you know, all of us would agree that COVID was the most defining probably healthcare experience of at least a generation. And I have the, the, the impression that it's one of the reasons why we can discuss, we are discussing how to harness um, healthcare data now for the future of health. So how, how has COVID impacted all these debates? How has it changed our approach to healthcare and the role of data in it? No, thank you, Federico. Uh, it's a great question. Thanks for having me here today. I, I think COVID-19, what it really did was accelerate something that was already happening. So there was already a realization in healthcare that data had a tremendous role and power actually to change the way we deliver care and we improve patient outcomes. So that was clearly happening, but COVID-19 really, I think, opened the eyes for everyone that we had to go faster in that change, in that transformation. And, and it's been done in many different ways. I mean, I think we all have probably experienced having virtual consultations, using telemedicine, uh, some people uh, have been remotely uh, monitored. So there has been many different digital technologies that have been, I would say, integrated in the healthcare delivery and accelerated. And all that is powered by data. In our company, for instance, we were using AI to identify where the next uh, outbreak of COVID-19 might happen so that we could accelerate the development of the vaccine in clinical trials. So, there's been many different points of, uh, uh, of acceleration due to COVID-19, and also in public health. I think uh, health authorities in general, they, I think, being open and acknowledge the value of collaborating around health data to track better the disease and to understand what was going to happen next so that they could do better healthcare planning. And I think all these different trends and changes have not only come as a response to COVID-19, but they really have come to stay. So there's more to come. I would say right now it's a big acceleration in the transformation. Yeah, thank you for, for sort of setting the scene. Um, I guess my, my next point would be to try, I mean, we, we discuss a lot, of course, about how big data is going to change our lives in a variety of, uh, of uh, fields. I have the feeling that the, the huge revolutionary implications of it for healthcare are not yet generally discussed. And so, I mean, my, my question would be, could you, could you help us see what's in it for, for us here in the room, for me, for you, for people in this audience, for, for ordinary people? What are the implications of this concretely? What will it mean? I mean, what does it mean harnessing the power of data for healthcare? What can it transform? So maybe starting from the top to each of us, I think. Um, the first thing I would like to, to share is, is the vision of our CEO, Joaquin Duato. Yeah. And he likes to say, actually, that in the next decade, we are going to see much more advancement in healthcare than the last century. Yeah. And the reason why he's saying that is because right now we are in a position, and, and I'm saying right now, it's not for the future, where we can really combine life science, data science, and technology in ways that we could never do before. So, there is a lot coming our way right now. Um, with this power of technology, we are able right now to analyze larger than ever data sets and see things that we were not able to see before. So generally speaking, uh, we see right now that actually healthcare is probably one of the sectors where more volume of data is gonna be created. By 2025, it's been said that it's gonna be one third of the total volume of data. Um, 
And the point is not necessarily only about the volume, but also how we make use of that data. And the use of that data could mean, in an effective way, that we will have better access. So each of us will have access to the right treatment at the right time in our lives. It could also help health authorities to better plan and be more efficient, even to help diagnosis so that we identify the patients again at the right time, so that we enter them in the, in the healthcare delivery in an optimal way. It could also help collaboration. So it can help actually through data. It can help actually that the entire ecosystem uh, from hospital, from primary care, it can really help that everyone collaborates so that we have a 360 of the patient and again, we deliver optimal care. But also even in healthcare innovation, data can help us actually understand much better the diseases and bring new technologies. So for example, in J&J, we're using right now the power of data and data science to better understand diseases, but I would even say to redefine diseases. So really completely change the way we perceive and define diseases and bring new treatments that will really be more targeted, more optimal for every person. So we're really talking about personalized medicine, which is really means that we get really the right customized treatment for each of us at the right time. So all this is really happening. The power of AI, I think it's also very important and it's real, really pretty much in the conversation right now uh, with generative AI. And we also see huge power in, in, in healthcare because it could predict diseases, but it could also, for example, help surgeons to understand better what are they doing at that moment, right? To really understand better what are they really intervening on and what are really the optimal ways to actually deliver better outcomes for the patient. So there is uh, less uh, recovery time and then they can all come back to, to the normal lives as soon as possible. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, there is another dimension. I mean, we tend to think of healthcare as a national competency. Certainly before, before COVID in an EU context, we tended to. Uh, I think this is slowly changing. I mean, this commission is putting a lot of effort into uh, developing, for example, a European uh, healthcare sort of union, health union. Uh, but what I would like to ask you about is a new attention that the commission has dedicated precisely to the topic of our discussion, which is healthcare data. There is a new proposal for, uh, for, regula for regulation uh, on a European health data space. The commission would like to yeah. build a European health uh, data space. And I think they have in mind, you know, harnessing some of the potential that you have just described. So my, my next question is, can you, can you uh, sort of give us an idiot's guide to, to what it, what's in this and, and make us understand whether it is enough to achieve the, uh, to open the horizons that you have just described? So, I mean, if I was to really simplify what the European Health Data Space is trying to do, um, I would say first, it will try to empower each of us to have better access to our own health data so that we are more in control of our own journey as patients, you know, when we need to go through any episode. Uh, it would also help uh, doctors, by the way, to have more information about you, so you actually the delivery of care becomes more optimal. I think that's one side of it. The other side of it is how do we bring better public health, as I said, mentioned before, so better planning of that, but also how we bring more um, and better uh, research, innovation, even AI, as I mentioned before, and solutions that will deliver precision medicine. So there are these two big dimensions. Now, I believe that actually the European Health Space is actually a one of its kind uh, piece of legislation because it's really ambitious. It's not only about connecting data and making data accessible, is even bringing a change in culture. In healthcare, I would say, traditionally, we have collected so much data, but all this data stays in, I would say, electronic shelves. 90% mm. uh, of it is not really used. The European Health Data Space is really trying to change that. So it will also require a shift in mentality from every actor involved in healthcare. Um, and it would also potentially, has the potential, to bring more trust, because one of the things around data is actually how do we trust that data is going to be used for the right purpose by the right people. Um, so I think bringing that uh, harmonized approach, a common framework, and breaking silos among member states, 
uh, is potentially going to unlock the power of data as we were discussing it before. So really huge potential. Now we need to make sure that the European Health Data Space is future-proof, which means that we really put all the types of data that will actually be helpful to innovate in future, but also it's well-resourced. And particularly, uh, I'm also thinking uh, that it needs to also have some good uh, accompanying measures to bring society along, particularly if we think of literacy and skills, because if we talk about so much data and digital, do really people understand the power of that? What are really the benefits or potential downsides of it? We believe that there is a cultural change to go through with the European Health Data Space, but certainly a big promise. Indeed, I mean, in, in a previous exchange, you, you mentioned the expression a cultural data partnership, which I, I thought was very interesting and insightful uh, from this point of view. Look, we, uh, we are, you, you mentioned, I mean, one of the goals is to make sure that we feel more in control of the data. And I think one, this is probably, I would say, the elephant in the room for many people, I mean, including probably people in this audience, it's the issue of privacy, right? I mean, we understand that there is a need for data sharing, data access to, to, to favor, you know, exploration, uh, personalized medicines, uh, as you said, maybe we'll get, get back to that in a moment. Um, but people concern, especially in this continent, which prides itself for a, for a very high, uh, long tradition and high standards of privacy protection is What's, how, how do we make sure that we balance you know, access and sharing on the one end with privacy on the other? So what's, what's your take on that? So, listen, our take, and, and I'm not only talking about my company. I'm really, uh, I, I would say I feel confident that we're really talking on behalf of the healthcare community. Um, our take is really that health and, and privacy are not a zero-sum game. Um, it's not either or. Uh, it's not, and, and many times in this debate, we really confront uh, the privacy of the patient with the right of the patient also to have uh, optimal care. And we believe that actually both can certainly coexist and should coexist. So certainly, by no means, we, we believe that actually uh, innovation needs to go ahead of the, the, the fundamental rights of every patient. But we actually have already for decades in the healthcare community in general managed and handled very sensitive data in a very careful manner. So we have a long experience on dealing with this data, and there are many di different ways of doing it, from, I would say, more technological approaches, like uh, safety or privacy by, desi privacy by design uh, approaches of technologies, to also data sharing models. So for instance, when data is very, very sensitive, and we want that to, to stay local, to stay, for example, in the hospital premises, federated models uh, where we can actually make the question, the research question, the query, go and travel across, but leave the data where it is, local. So really still contained in those premises. There are many, many different approaches where today we can really unlock the power of data while preserving privacy. So we believe that's not a zero-sum game. There are solutions, there are approaches. We just all need to work together around that. Thanks. Well, I see that the, the clock is ticking, so we probably have time for only one additional question, although there will be, of course, many uh, interesting points to raise. So I'd like to go back in conclusion, also to end on a sort of futuristic note as we started, uh, to this issue of personalized medicine. I mean, I have the impression as a, as a non-healthcare expert, but as a citizen, I have the impression that this is, as you also hinted, this is the new frontier of healthcare. Uh, it, it is also very much related probably to artificial intelligence. So there is a whole new ecosystem emerging to which, you know, harnessing data is central. But can you, can you now let us see what is the whole ecosystem? I mean, beyond data, what else needs to be put in place to reach this personalized healthcare and what would it mean in practice? Yeah. I would like to probably emphasize first, uh, and I would say foremost, is people. Um, and when I mean people, I mean literacy. So we really need to make sure that every individual is able to understand, harness, and use those technologies. And this is very important in healthcare, because if you don't have that, if you only have a segmented part of the population, actually the solutions you're trying to do, they are biased. They are not really targeting a representative uh, uh, population that you're trying to solve with. So 
I, I think one of the first things is really how do we bring people on board, how we are more inclusive in these digital solutions so that they are, all can participate and the innovation that happens as a consequence is again more inclusive and is more targeted. I think that's the first one. The second one, um, and, you, and you highlighted that before as well, is collaboration. I mean, this is really uh, again, consistent that needs collaboration across the board, from really uh, upstream to downstream, uh, with inclusion of patients and people, as I mentioned before. Without that collaboration, then the third thing cannot happen, which is trust. And trust is very, very important because, again, there is, and, and that's something we also discovered with COVID, there is no single actor or even country that has the solution uh, to every problem. Therefore, that collaboration is so, so, so critical. And, and that will finally, I would say, allow innovation. And you mentioned AI. AI has huge power. It also has its own limitations. We need to understand them too. Uh, but certainly, we cannot, we cannot unlock that power if we don't have the access to the data, if we don't have the collaboration, if we don't have the skills and literacy, and we don't have uh, the understanding of that ecosystem. So uh, those will be probably my, my four points to, to summarize uh, this discussion. Thank you very much, Angel. I mean, as I said, we could continue, but unfortunately, time is up. So uh, thanks, everyone, and I hand the floor over back to, to Sandra. Thank you.